And so perhaps tell us, as a way to begin the conversation, um, where did you uh, grow up and uh, what was the world in which you grew up? Well, I was born in 1951, so that's uh, not that uh, long after the end of the Second World War, in Brussels, uh, capital of uh, Belgium. And uh, what is perhaps uh, relevant for what will happen to me, uh, what was going to happen to me later on in life, is that uh, I was sort of bilingual from an, a very early age. My parents uh, had been educated in French, but were of uh, Flemish uh, origin. And um, I was myself sent to a French school from the beginning, but uh, partly because of the insistence of one of my grandfathers, my first uh, language, my mother tongue, was uh, Dutch. And, uh, and so uh, I'm very grateful for, uh, to him for having insisted on that, so that uh, although now my uh, uh, mother tongue is not uh, uh, in no longer the language I speak with my mother, who is uh, still alive, because we switched to French after a while. I've uh, always had this sort of uh, feeling of uh, being able to speak in both languages and having a particular uh, affinity to both language communities. Mm -hmm. So how was it to, to grow up in Belgium in the 50s and, and, and 60s? Well, what, what I, kind of country uh, was Belgium at the time? Uh, well, it was uh, a country like uh, all that was uh, in the 1950s, that was in a way still recovering uh, from the war, but uh, growing very fast. Uh, we had the one thing that stuck in the memories of all the Belgians of my generation was the uh, Exposition Universelle, the, uh, the world uh, exhibition in Brussels in 1958. Uh, particularly the American pavilion, which uh, was really uh, sort of uh, exuded this uh, feeling of optimism about and of uh, modernity the future. And, uh, That's right. And so a number of things were done in this uh, spirit, especially um, in, in Brussels. Uh, there was, uh, in fact, in front of the house where I was living in Big Avenue, in the house that my great-grandfather got built, they built then a, a viaduct for cars at the level of the of the first floors yeah. of the houses, the thought that it was dismantled uh, decades later, but it's sort of crazy things that people were doing at that time mm -hmm. in order to be modern. And Brussels itself has suffered a lot yes. in this period, what's called Brusselisation, which is sort of destruction of many of old houses in order to build uh, ugly uh, uh, apartment buildings to, to replace them. And so that was what I uh, remember, it was certainly also uh, a city and a country that was far more homogeneous in terms of uh, ethnic origins, uh, this holds in particular from Brussels, for Brussels, than what is the case now. Mm -hmm. When uh, and later on I left Brussels when I was 20 and returned to live there only um, when I was 45, but mm -hmm. I didn't recognize the city mm -hmm. in which I had lived uh, uh, my, the first 20 years so of my life. So as a teenager, you went to high school, I guess, in Brussels. Yes. So what were the, the, the subjects in which you were particularly interested as a, as a high school student? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, <laughs> there was... Uh, <laughs> I sort of was interested in, in most subjects. Uh, frankly, I did... Uh, what was called Humanités Anciennes, uh, so that I uh, studied uh, Latin and Greek, uh, which uh, meant that uh, we had a, a huge amount of uh, Latin, huge amount of Greek, but uh, very little by way of modern languages. I only started, uh, we only started studying uh, uh, other languages apart from the second national language, Dutch, uh, German, and English in the last uh, three years of, uh, of uh, secondary school. But uh, I developed quite early a particular interest in history. In mm -hmm. fact, when I was 11, 12... So not uh, philosophy, but history. History was my uh, sort of main interest. So I was captivated uh, by reading history. I was so excited when my parents bought this pocket edition of the 12 volumes of uh, something, uh, the history of, the, of uh, mankind in the Marabou University. Mm -hmm. I remember cheap, not very good quality, mm -hmm. but uh, very exciting uh, for me. And so when I read the uh, Many, many other things I remember reading uh, with great uh, fascination. Uh, uh, biography of Lenin, for example, <laughs> biography of Caesar. W uh, why this early interest in history and, and uh, did this early interest in history uh, influence uh, 
years later the way you, you practice philosophy. It, it, it certainly did because the, the way in which uh, I sort of evolved is that through this interest in history I became interested in politics because mm -hmm. it's all well to try to understand what happened uh, in the past and why and why things went wrong in, at certain points in history. Uh, and it's another to try to draw the lessons from all that in order to improve the situation in our countries in our world now. And so when by the time I was uh, 14 or 15, I thought that what I really needed to study is law. Not because law was exciting in itself, but because at the time it seemed to be an absolute precondition for uh, doing something in, in politics. And so that's how from history I went uh, to interest in politics and from interest in politics to uh, the project of uh, studying law. So history led you to politics, uh, politics led you to law, and down the road law led you to philosophy. It did too because, uh, so because of this interest in politics uh, forced you then to think at some point, yes, but ultimately what matters? What, uh, I mean, you want to make society better, what, what does it mean for a society to be better? Indeed, why bother with all this? And, uh, and so uh, by the time I well, became 16 or so, I had, as uh, many other people have had, a sort of existential crisis. And I suddenly thought, well, what I need to do, and I, I remember using a phrase taken for from uh, Kafka, which was to need to clarify the ultimate aims. And, uh, and so that's uh, what I then uh, thought uh, should be the priority and that I shouldn't really start engaging in politics uh, before having clarified these ultimate purposes, what the meaning of life was, what, uh, what, uh, uh, what it meant to try to improve society. And which will lead you to philosophy in, in due time. And that is then what uh, convinced me that what I mm -hmm. should uh, study uh, was uh, be it uh, partly po uh, philosophy. Yeah. And, and so your early interest in history was not really geared towards uh, local uh, history or local politics, but uh, was more uh, an expression of interest towards global history, global politics, because you mentioned that you were reading a uh, biography of Lenin and so on. So uh, were you already connected with uh, 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 history and politics in Belgium, or were you interested more in, in the big picture, if you will? I was certainly far more interested in, in the big picture, starting, I mean, looking in detail at the history of the pharaohs and, and so on, of uh, ancient uh, Egypt, of, uh, and, and history of the United States, uh, whatever. And I found uh, local politics and all these quibbles between our linguistic uh, communities particularly boring and uh, and uh, uninteresting. So I followed that to some extent, but it was certainly not mm -hmm. the focus of my attention. Of course, this was uh, also the 19, uh, late 1950s and then 1960s, uh, the, the real, the, the, the beginning of, uh, the Euro of European integration, which, uh, and so the, then this uh, hesitant uh, non-decision, but uh, decision in the end to uh, have the main European institutions in Brussels, so, which happened in 1958. And so, the, and this was also something that uh, certainly mobilized me and excited me far more than uh, Belgian politics. So precisely as a witness, you, uh, as, a, as a teenager, you witnessed uh, somehow Brussels becoming a European city. And uh, how did it manifest itself? I mean, did Br Brussels move from being a, a, a small capital to becoming a big European uh, player? I mean, as a, as a teenager, did you witness the, the evolution and, 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 and a change in the outlook of the city, in the culture of the city, and so on? This was extremely gradual, because in, uh, we must realize that in 1958, and so the Treaty of Rome was signed, which created the European Economic Community, was signed in, uh, uh, in 1957. But, and it was due to come into operation on the 1st of January 1958. But there was still no agreement at that point about where the uh, seat of the new uh, commissions would be, of the new communities uh, would be. There was an emergency meeting in Paris on the 6th of January and uh, where they couldn't agree. They all agreed that uh, all the commissions had to be in one city, but they didn't agree uh, about which city it would be. And then the Belgium being the first uh, 
uh, country in alphabetical order had the first presidency of the uh, uh, economic, um, European Economic Commission. And so there was uh, some, uh, an office building uh, being uh, completed uh, just uh, at the time, not very far from where I live now uh, in Brussels, and the foreign, Belgian foreign minister, minister was the first chair of uh, the uh, of the council uh, decided then to rent some uh, buildings uh, in which to put uh, the first. Uh, That's how uh, it started. That's totally random. Started. Totally random. It was just the alphabetical order because uh, Belgium had the first semester uh, of presidency, and um, and so at that time, so that meant that for Brussels, as such, it didn't make a big difference because all the uh, civil servants of the European Union, so it, uh, the now called Eurocrats, they were all in a single office block. And then six months later, when it was Germany's turn, Deutschland, second in alphabetical order, the decision was still not taken, so they stayed in Brussels, and then Charles Little de Gaulle became yeah. president of France, and mm -hmm. it was as obvious for him that the seat should be in Paris of as course. it was obvious for the other five that it shouldn't be. And so people realized the situation would remain blocked for a while, and so it was one building, then they built the, the Berlaymont building, uh, uh, not far, not far away, and then more buildings, and then uh, at some point the council needed to have uh, its own building. It built it next to the the Berlaymont building of the European Commission, and then the Parliament decided it should have some offices. So, so there was no it. real, uh, real formal decision. No. So you know, uh, Brussels became uh, uh, a European city in an ad hoc fashion, in a way. Yeah, it it, it was certainly uh, so. Uh, there was no formal decision. There was just uh, exposed uh, sort of confirmation mm -hmm. that a number of things had happened, and it's only in in 2000. So, uh, so we started there in 1958. It's only 2000, so over more than 40 ye years later that uh, uh, Brussels was for the first time called capital of the European yeah. Union. Interesting. So you you finish high school uh, in the late. Uh, 60s, and so did you end up studying law, or did you go straight to philosophy? No, then uh, I decided that uh, I could still postpone the decision, and so I, uh, my first degree, in fact, I, I, I turned out to be possible for me to do three first degrees at the same time. So I did one in philosophy, I did one in economics, and I did one in law. In law. And it's only then when uh, I went And all this in Brussels? In Brussels, but it's in, a, in something called the Faculté Saint-Louis, which is in fact a sort of component, or due to become a component of the University of Louvain, but uh, based in Brussels. And so when I went to Louvain for my second degree, called the Licence at the time, then I had to choose, and uh, I hesitated for a significant time between uh, philosophy and economics. Law, I had tried, but uh, decided that... wasn't for that you. It, I liked law, but uh, I thought the priority should still uh, be uh, with philosophy or possibly with economics. But economics, not because I felt um, uh, I would become an economist, but because I felt that knowing a good deal of economics was absolutely essential to do the sort of philosophy I wanted to do, which was political philosophy. Yes. So, and so I hesitated a bit between doing economics first or philosophy first. In the end, I chose uh, philosophy, but uh, doing philosophy, but um, it was philosophy of science mainly. My first uh, thesis was on the, on the philosophical foundations of mathematical statistics, so it was more on that side because I felt that in order to do political philosophy later on, I needed to have a strong basis both in philosophy of science and mm. in economics. Yeah. So as, as, a, as a young man, so in the late 60s, you are studying at uh, the Faculty Saint-Louis. So uh, how is it being a student uh, in Brussels uh, in the late 60s while you have all this turmoil taking place in Paris and all over Europe? And, and, and at the time, what was the focus of, uh, of your studies in terms of philosophy, law, and economics? I mean, what was uh, uh, at the forefront of, of, the fi of these fields at the time? Well, I, I, for me, university was really, I would say, exhilarating. There was something like a, an opening up in terms of uh, uh, academic disciplines, uh, also intellectual disciplines, so especially as I could do so many disciplines at the same time. I had never had a, a course either in economics or in psychology or in philosophy at secondary school, so there was all this, and, uh, and I certainly <laughs> enjoyed that uh, 
very much. But at the same time, there was something like this post-68 uh, yes. atmosphere. In fact, in the sec my second year at university, I was president of the students in, uh, in this place called St. Louis, and I, I ended up the only time in my life uh, so far in prison because we, at the very beginning of the academic year, there, has, there was a, a strike, a hunger strike going on in Louvain uh, in support of uh, uh, foreign students. There was a plan to increase uh, significantly the fees for foreign students, which, uh, who in Louvain were then mostly uh, students from uh, Latin America and uh, from uh, uh, Africa. Mm. And uh, this was regarded as grossly unfair by the students, so they started a hunger, a hunger strike on that. Seems now uh, a bit of a, a strange thing to do. I wouldn't uh, uh, expect our students now to, to do that on that sort of issue, but perhaps they would. And, um, and then in support of that strike, we decided, uh, so I convened the General Assembly of the students, and we decided to march on the Ministry of Justice in Brussels. So we did, but of course it was an unauthorized uh, uh, demonstration, and, um, and uh, so the leaders of the demonstration were arrested, and I ended up uh, spending a, a day in, uh, in the prison, in the Amigo prison, in uh, in Brussels, which has a number of interesting precedents, including Karl Marx mm -hmm. spent uh, a couple of nights there before expelled from Belgium, being expelled from Belgium in 1848. So uh, I, I must say my memories of my brief stay in prison are not that bad. Mm -hmm. And and uh, at the time, the, the the students were demonstrating against uh, uh, the situation in Belgium. Or uh, did you have a connection with the situation, in, you know, in, in in Africa? I mean, for instance, was uh, neocolonialism, for instance, uh, a matter of concern for for the for the students demonstrating, or, or was uh, discontent uh, f geared towards simply the situation in Belgium, in Europe, and so on? Uh, at the time, it was uh, certainly perceived as not being closely connected to the history of colonialism. So mm -hmm. the Congo had become independent uh, then about 10 years uh, before, but it was more uh, so uh, uh, welcoming so many foreign students uh, in our universities, especially in Louvain, was above all a show of support for the opposition to the dictatorial regimes in a number of countries, in particular in Latin America. And yes. So the reason why uh, the, the student movement mobilized was that it was felt that there would be less possibility for the for our university, in particular, to train than the the, the elite, the, the democratic yeah. elite in those countries. And and all this was in the late sixties, early seventies. That was in seventy two. Seventy two, yeah. just for instance, yeah. one year before the coup in Chile and so on. So, yeah. but uh, things were brewing in Latin America, and so you, this is your first degree, and then you decide to do a, a doctorate in philosophy. But uh, rather than staying in uh, in Belgium, you. You, you go abroad. That's Why the decision and, and, and your choice was the UK? Yes, and uh, I must say I was uh, uh, I crossed the channel, as it were, as a sort of uh, intellectual refugee, because uh, the sort of philosophy that was taught uh, on the continent in general, particularly in my university, I, find, I found was not the sort of philosophy I wanted to practice Why? myself. Because it was essentially history of philosophy, continental philosophy. That's right, for two reasons. In fact, a, a lot of the, most of the philosophy that was taught was not really philosophy, but was a comment on what philosophers in the past had done. Yeah. And so my view of the job of a philosopher was that a philosopher had to philosophize and not to talk about other philosophers. Yes. And so that was uh, one aspect. And then. The little that went beyond that was done, uh, in my view, in such an opaque uh, language that uh, uh, I found uh, it should be possible to do better. And so under, uh, I had one uh, professor in Louvain for whom I've always had uh, great admiration all, all the way to, to, to the night he died when I, I still saw him when he was uh, in his uh, 80s. Uh, his name was uh, Jean Ladrier, who oh, is a course. specialist uh, yeah, of, of uh, philosophy of science. Yes. He was also a mathematician, but with just tremendously broad interest and an extremely clear mind. And, uh, and he's the one who converted me to analytical philosophy. 
made me read uh, Karl Popper. I, I remember the first uh, thing that was then what suddenly I discovered that uh, the sort of uh, thing I had been vaguely looking for in the writings of Althusser or other uh, French philosophers, I mean, this sort of clear thinking was far better exemplified by uh, people then who owed something to the to the Vienna Circle and the, the analytical tradition in the strict sense. But then I discovered, of course, far mm -hmm. uh, more uh, authors, and uh, including then in the fields of ethics and, uh, and political philosophy. And so given that this was a sort of philosophy that interested me, I uh, decided I would try to go to an Anglo. Uh, so, and then you went to Oxford. That's when I went and to Oxford, and that's where I did my doctorate. Yeah, and, and, and from the start, I mean, because throughout the years, I mean, what has been the main theme of your work has been justice, uh, social and political justice, uh, connected with strong concerns with economic matters. But uh, your PhD was, uh, as you mentioned earlier, dealing with uh, philosophy of science. So, with whom did you work? What at Oxford? What was the atmosphere at Oxford? And why did you, why, why did you choose to really start your career in the, in, in the field of philosophy by focusing on philosophy of science? Yes, so my very first degree, so my uh, licence uh, deg degree, the, the thesis I wrote was on the foundations of mathematical statistics, but then I wanted to move then more into the philosophy of the social sciences broadly conceived from uh, economics uh, to linguistics and that's what I did then both my uh, doctorates on the, I did a doctorate in Louvain in the social sciences with Jean Ladrière who I just mentioned but also my Oxford uh, doctorate uh, was uh, became then my first book uh, uh, under the title Evolutionary Explanation in the Social Sciences yes. and mm -hmm. uh, published in 1981 and uh, <coughs> And there my, and so I, I wanted to have a topic that would enable me to explore quite uh, freely uh, some central aspects of uh, several disciplines in, in the social science. So, so, you know, I guess that from the start your, your, your main interest was uh, issues of justice and yet you felt that there was a need for you to focus on uh, methodology and epistemology of, so, of social sciences. So what was going to be the intellectual, if you will, gain are focusing on these issues for uh, your later work on justice. Yes, that's a fair way of uh, describing it. And I, I was, in fact, my first supervisor was uh, Brian Barry, who is yes. uh, known mainly for his contribution also to the to, to the theory of justice. But I, when I uh, first uh, met him and uh, in all our exchanges, in fact, uh, we didn't talk about political philosophy at all. And uh, then he left. Uh, to go to uh, North America, from which he only returned decades later. And uh, uh, he was replaced as my supervisor by a New Zealander, philosopher of science called uh, Rom Harry, who then uh, sort of supervised me up to uh, the end, but with whom I didn't exchange uh, uh, that much. So uh, yeah, I got into contact during my uh, Oxford period with uh, someone who had a far greater influence on me and who became my external examiner, uh, and that was uh, uh, Jerry Cohen, G.A. Cohen, uh, who then later became a professor of political philosophy at Oxford and uh, with whom I've uh, also then interacted up to his uh, untimely death uh, two years ago. Two years ago. And, and so, uh, you know, so in the, as a doctorate student, you focus on epistemology and methodology of social, of social sciences. And, and so what was the, the, the goal for you in terms of doing this for, for, for then your studies on, on, on justice? What were, uh, what were your expectations in terms of the intellectual gains that you would acquire, that, that you would achieve out of this through your, 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 work, your later work on justice? Well, I, I was obviously... You were trying to, to explore the foundations of social science knowledge well, I, I realized that uh, uh, if you wanted to say what should happen with our societies, uh, what uh, good society is, even uh, possibly a just society, if one focuses on justice, one could not do so in a way that uh, was not naive without relying massively on the results, on what we can learn from the social sciences. And so, therefore, to understand what the social sciences can say, are able to say, and to establish what they cannot say, uh, 
or what the nature of explanation is in the social sciences, what, how social sciences vary bet uh, uh, between themselves, so how, uh, uh, what, uh, what place should be legitimately given to uh, the, the assumption of, uh, rational, of rationality in the social science. All these questions I wanted to clarify enough to be able to uh, talk, interact, in a competent way, in a sufficiently competent way with uh, social scientists of all sorts. Yeah, and be more confident later on regarding your ability to talk about what should be about norms, values and so on by connecting this discourse on norms and values with uh, the foundations of social sciences and with the discourse of, of social sciences. Yes, okay. so a simple way of uh, putting it is that for me it was certainly important as a political philosopher not to be epistemologically naive, that is uh, and sort of being naive about uh, and the, the, the potentials and, uh, the, uh, and also the limits of uh, social scientific knowledge, and at the same time not to be economically naive and, uh, and not to assert all, all sorts of things which the social scientific disciplines, uh, especially then the one generally considered as the most prestigious uh, among them, uh, economics uh, uh, would have to say. Mm -hmm. So how many years did you spend at Oxford? I had two periods uh, in Oxford as a student, uh, first two years and then one and a half later on. And you took uh, mainly courses in, in the field of philosophy, in the field of social... Uh, what were the, 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 the areas in which or on which you focused? Uh, yes, well, I had... Uh, well, Oxford was organized and still is in a pretty loose way, so I didn't... Uh, was there mainly to write my doctorate and I could attend courses or um, uh, seminars in a fairly free way. And I had uh, seminars in economics. I remember John Hicks was still teaching at the time. Uh, but I had some uh, in sociology and I had uh, some in, in philosophy. I had contacts with some linguists. Uh, so it was quite uh, quite varied. So yes. I was, uh, my thesis was officially in the sub-faculty of philosophy, philosophy yeah. but uh, the training was pretty yeah. multidisciplinary. And after Oxford, you, you decided to go back to Belgium. That's right. So in between my two periods in Oxford, I spent one semester in Germany, in uh, the University of Bielefeld. And Which was uh, very strong at the time on sociology. Yeah, yeah. where I had uh, Niklas Luhmann among mm -hmm. my teachers, class of also at the time. And then uh, and I spent one year in Berkeley, and then I returned to Oxford for one and a half year. And after that, uh, so by that time, it was 1980, I returned to Berkeley. So 30 years ago. Uh, Berkeley in the late 70s, how was Berkeley in the late 70s? And how did the, uh, the culture of an American campus uh, uh, differ from the one of a, of a British or German campus? Well, it was a, a strange experience because um, when you cross the channel, uh, there are some uh, differences in the way people look and the way people behave, but there was above all for me uh, an enormous difference in the way in which philosophy was practiced. Then I crossed the Atlantic and there was a big difference in the way people looked, or I did more than cross the Atlantic, I went all the way to the Pacific coast, and uh, there was a big difference in the way people uh, looked and behaved, but uh, the philosophy they were doing was the same, was the same. as in Oxford, or essentially the same. I <laughs> remember the contrast between Strawson, who was one of the professors in Oxford, so still teaching with his gowns and uh, sort of uh, walking about in the streets with his umbrella under, uh, uh, at his arm, and then up all the way to California, where you had essentially people teaching the same, of, same sort of thing, discussing in the same way, but with the professor in uh, in shorts, with his dog under the uh, under the the seminar table, and so uh, so there was this um, sort of feeling also of uh, great variety in a way, freedom in a way. Pe people looked also sort of racial variety, which already mm -hmm. was quite uh, significant uh, at the time, and uh, and obviously because of the if only because of the climate. It, it, the spirit of my life has a different flavor. And who the were the major philosophers at the time at Berkeley, especially in the field of justice? Did you have a group of people working on justice issues at Berkeley at the time? Well, I certainly, if there were, I had no contacts at all with them because that was the time where I was mainly focusing during my two doctorates on economics, and so I followed uh, mainly seminars, most of the seminars I followed uh, in a systematic way were in economics. Uh, the most 
<coughs> illustrious um, philosopher in the philosophy department who I met obviously during my time was uh, uh, John Searle, a philosopher of language, but uh, he did a little bit on uh, ethical matters, uh, but uh, really uh, very little. So I uh, and um, uh, so there were I did some sociology. Talcott Parsons, who had already retired at the time from Harvard, was there as a visiting professor for a while. So I also attended the seminar with him, and so it was quite varied. But I most of what I did was in economics during that so, year. So in, in between your interest for uh, the epistemology of social sciences and then uh, your, 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 your work on justice, you had uh, uh, a few years during which you focused on economics. So what were the questions in which you were interested uh, uh, during this time and, and how did this focus on economics uh, help you to, uh, in your work on justice later on? Well, uh, the first thing, in fact, during my period in Bielefeld, uh, what I spent a significant part of my time on was to read Das Kapital in German. And uh, I read uh, from the first line to the last line, volume one of Kapital, the only one that uh, Marx uh, actually completed. And I found it very important, though I've never uh, been a uh, Marxist myself, but uh, I've always described myself. But you have written on Marxism quite a bit. But I've written on Marx. In fact, a number, I did, wrote a number of essays which were then collected under the title Marxism Recycled, and which was a bit the sort of attitude I uh, had adopted from the start, but found it very important sort of get a, a good grip of what uh, was in uh, in Marx's work, uh, I want to understand in depth, not only by reading Marx, but what were the main critiques that were made uh, against capitalism, obviously a central theme in the contemporary political philosophy. And so there were some critiques that were of a more strictly economic nature about the efficiency or inefficiency of capitalism. There were some other critiques that were immediately of a more moral type about uh, exploitation and so on. And I really wanted to understand these things in depth, not just uh, superficially. And certainly I didn't want that, to dismiss them without uh, looking at them in great detail. But at the same time, of course, I wanted to get uh, a proper introduction to contemporary economics, uh, neoclassical economics, the way it made use of game theory, etc., in a number of recent uh, development. It was something very trendy at the time uh, in my Berkeley period called disequilibrium economics. And so I explored uh, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And again, the, the general uh, uh, underlying motivation is what uh, was mentioned earlier, namely that in order to do political philosophy in a way that wouldn't be naive, it was really, it seemed to me, really important to understand economic theories of all sorts. Of all depth. sorts, yes, yes. And so after Berkeley, you returned to, uh, to, to Belgium? I had my second period in Oxford, then, where I completed my doctorate, mm -hmm. uh, in, which became my book, Evolutionary Explanation in Social Sciences, and then I returned to Berkeley. And then you begin your work uh, on, on justice issues. And, and nowadays, you're one of the uh, top philosophers in the world in the field of, uh, of social and, and, and political and even perhaps economic justice. So, uh, and you have been working in this field now for more than 30 years. So on, on the issue of justice, what, what, what are the questions uh, with which you, you started? I mean, what was the, the initial puzzle which uh, triggered your, your, your work on justice? On the one hand, the sort of radical critique of capitalism that was generally associated with the Marxist tradition, but had then received a sort of a uh, a new uh, strength uh, as a result of the f publication of the first contributions to so-called analytical Marxism. And so there was this book by uh, Jerry Cohen, who uh, before he became professor in Oxford called the Karl Marx's Theory of History uh, Defense. There was then a book by John Romer uh, called The General, Exploit uh, General Theory of Exploitation and Class. And then also, uh, somewhat later, a book by uh, Jon Elster uh, called Making Sense of Marx. And this was, uh, I liked the attitude, the attitude which consists in saying, well, there are some deep insights, but let's not be complacent about this tradition. A uh, lot of it is just nonsense, uh, bullshit, as they uh, said. It needs to be trashed, and then the rest needs to be reformulated in with the best tools of so-called bourgeois economics or uh, analytical philosophy and so on. So that's something that 
I found exciting. So you, the, 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 your, your first uh, point of interest was a radical uh, critic of, of capitalism, calling upon uh, Marx, but uh, uh, Marx inhabited with a uh, uh, kind of bourgeois take of economics issues. The, the modern rigorous tools yes. that are, were often dismissed by people on the left as yes. being a sort of compromise so of bourgeois. So a very thing. different reading of Marx comp you know, uh, compared to the, the ones existing at the time in Germany and even in France. Sure. Okay. But this was only one of the so one impulses. Aspect. And another one was then the radical defense of uh, capitalism by uh, uh, radical libertarians a la Nozick. So I discovered Nozick and found it um, exciting uh, before I read Rawls, for, uh, for example. And I found this, this sort of uh, no-nonsense, or I don't think it looks like a no-nonsense radical defense of uh, freedom, so uh, uh, including uh, then the, the economic freedoms, I found that uh, a really important challenge and something maybe I, I couldn't agree with with its uh, implication, but it was important really to take it uh, to take it seriously. So, so these were the two. So, of, so you, uh, you, you 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 try to bring together a radical critique of capitalism and a, a radical defense of capitalism. Yeah. And so the, the you know then the question is how do you do that? And so your way of doing it was to focus on the notion of freedom. That's right. So, so I so in tell a us way, a bit well, about this. Yeah. Why so, why this focus on freedom and how does uh, much attention given to freedom bring these two uh, uh, opposite things together. That's right. So my, uh, so the, the way in which I try to do that is uh, by saying yes, freedom is of great importance. Uh, the libertarians are right, but it has to be real freedom. That is not just the right to do things, but the capacity, the power to do things, the resources to do things. And of course, it must be this real freedom, not just the formal freedom. This real freedom, in this sense for all and not only for the so rich also or the, the issue of equality and then so it, it's a way of uh, indicating that equality and freedom are not sort of values that clash with each other but what we need to go for is freedom but the freedom of all and so therefore and to try to give this real freedom to the highest level possible to those with least of that real freedom. And it seems that uh, uh, over the years in fact uh, all your work has been trying to, to bring these two things together uh, which tends to be quite separate in the history of ideas and so on, equality and, and, and freedom. Yes, it's certainly. Uh, a, a Would it be a, a, a good way to characterize the specificity of, the, of your work trying to marry these two things which we tend to really... Uh, uh well, it would, would, would be a way of characterizing uh, uh, the sort of view I defend, but uh, n probably not the specificity because it's a feature that's shared with a number of uh, other authors. But it's certainly true that what and the conception of justice which I defend and which I'm prepared to, uh, to vindicate against uh, our objections is one that is at the same time egalitarian and libertarian. Uh, mm -hmm. The freedom is central, but because I focus on this, giving this freedom at the highest level, this real freedom at the highest level to everyone, it's also uh, 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 egalitarian. But I say it's not specific to my work because what I discovered, of course, in the process that this sort of approach, the approach to which I was led by taking seriously both the Marxist critique of capitalism and the libertarian defense of capitalism, this view to which I was led had more than a superficial uh, resemblance with the main conception of justice that had been articulated and uh, formulated in the, the 1970s, namely John Rawls's uh, theory, theory of justice. I must say that I bought uh, the paperback version of his book, which I had never heard of before, as soon as I arrived in Oxford in 1974. But I only read it six years later. So mm -hmm. it uh, remained there. I glanced, the uh, title looked enticing <laughs> enough, A Theory of Justice, but the content looked pretty boring once. Uh, and dry. High yeah. And dry. And so uh, given that I was working on philosophy of science and economics, I put it aside. And then I only, it's only when I returned to Louvain in 1980 that I really read it seriously. And then uh, gradually, uh, initially with some suspicion, but then gradually I thought, well, this man had really got a number of things right, and this was uh, uh, an honest thinker with a tremendous culture, with uh, 
also someone who'd be given the, the chance of working on this book fairly undisturbed until he was 50. Yeah, for 20 book years, when he was yes. 50 and he had only published uh, five or six articles uh, by the time he was 50. And uh, <laughs> I sometimes, even now, still have this, this feeling that uh, something can be said about John Rawls, which uh, Pascal, Blaise Pascal said about God, which is that uh, a little bit of thinking uh, takes you away from uh, him, but uh, a bit more thinking takes Brings you back, back yes. uh, to that because he's really thought of so many objections to his view, consider them seriously, and then you'll find a footnote on page 735 of his book where he deals with it. Did you ever, did you ever have a chance to meet, to, 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 to meet him, to, 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 to work with him uh, in, in the years following your discovery of his, uh, of yes, his work? Yes, I uh, met him several times, and uh, so the, the first time is uh, very memorable for, for me because uh, in 1987, the uh, Edition du Seuil and uh, um, decided to organize a big uh, Rolls Congress in Paris on the occasion of, of the publication of the French mm -hmm. translation. So, and so I had uh, twice uh, the privilege of having a very long uh, breakfast conversation with uh, Rolls, a very pleasant, uh, modest uh, uh, man. And so I had uh, about uh, 73 questions ready or so uh, <laughs> in which uh, had been uh, prompted by the reading of his uh, theory of justice, including then one question on which, uh, which, uh, who's, to which I got an answer that disappointed me and in fact led me to do a lot of work afterwards, which was that it seemed to me that from what I could understand in his principles, from what he sa himself suggests in terms of its uh, policy implications, his theory of justice really uh, forced us to endorse the introduction of an unconditional basic income, something in... Which is one of, the, uh, one of your key ideas. Which, to which, which is an idea to which yeah. I had come uh, some years before, and it seemed to me that there, in Rawls' the theory, there was a beautiful philosophical justification for it. And that's where he told me, uh, to my disappointment, he said, no, no, Philippe, uh, this doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't to follow work. because... Uh, Think of these people who spend their days surfing off Malibu. Uh, surely they should uh, not live at uh, the expense of that. other people because of the choice they make. And he, in the footnote of the lecture he presented there in, uh, in Paris, uh, he wrote something about this Malibu surface and indeed he modified this, uh, one of his principles, a difference principle, by introducing leisure into it in such a way that uh, these Malibu surfers would not be allowed to have uh, <laughs> to serve on the expense of uh, serve on the expense. And, mm -hmm. so, and so therefore and that led, uh, forced me in fact to think harder about what could justify such an unconditional basic income. He invited me then uh, later to, together with Amartya Sen, he invited me to give a lecture at Harvard in 1990 and uh, that was then subsequently published under the title Why Surfers Should Be Fed mm -hmm. and that was uh, an attempt to show that on the basis of Rawls's own premises, and despite what he explicitly says, uh, uh, an unconditional basic income would be justified. So I met him on that occasion, and I met him and, also. And, and what is the view of, uh, of Amartya Sen on this specific issue? Amartya Sen on these issues is, uh, is uh, uh, pragmatic, is very pragmatic, and so he says, and so uh, what he emphasized what he's been emphasizing, particularly in his latest book, the idea of justice is that his approach, contrary to Rawls's or Dworkin's or my own, his approach is a comparative approach. He doesn't claim uh, to uh, answer the question, what is a good society? He said, uh, which is the title of one of my French books, uh, he said there is no, when you want to engage in a theory of justice, there is no a worse question to start with than the question what is a good, what is a just society? Because it is not, it's not possible to answer such a question? Because he says it's both unnecessary and, uh, and, and also uh, no, no, it's not even useful in order to answer the sort of questions we need to answer. Because the sort of question we need to answer is whether this or that particular policy would make things better in terms of justice. So a much more modest in a way, in a way, being purely comparative and not superlative or transcendental, as mm -hmm. he says, and I'm saying the, uh, 
the, the most just, not trying to define the most just society mm. or the just society, but just us. And so therefore, as regards basic income, the introduction of an unconditional basic income, he says, well, in some circumstances, no doubt it would improve mm. things. In other circumstances, there are other measures that are more appropriate than that one. It's not that he's against it on grounds of principles, but it has to be assessed on a case by case. Basis. So precisely, if you had a way to characterize what uh, typifies your, your, your take on justice, I mean, uh, one way is, of course, uh, the attempt to reconcile equality and liberty uh, and freedom. What would be other ways to somehow, for the audience, uh, characterize your take on uh, issues of justice? A second one would be that you are trying to identify the principles uh, through which you can uh, say, well, this is uh, the best society possible, right? What would be other ways, once again, for the audience? Yes. Well, what is common to uh, many people who are uh, currently involved in the, these uh, discussions is that they want to? They all want to to combine to some extent equality and freedom, and probably give also some attention to efficiency considerations. And this is common to Rawls, uh, to Amartya Sen, to myself, and to Jerry Cohen, who was mentioned before, etc. So that is common to them. And uh, but the, what uh, what what's specific about uh, my uh, way of uh, trying to um, formulate this conception of justice is that, for me, the the way, the best way in which we must capture uh, what's going on in our world, in our societies, in terms of distribution, uh, is in uh, must use the notion of gift, and I'll try to uh, explain that uh, uh, briefly. And so. Um, the, and, and that's then directly related also to the question of an unconditional uh, basic income. Uh, and what we must realize, and for me that's really a starting point, is that we are, we, members of a society, and even more, of course, members of mankind, are given very different opportunities, very different gifts often incorporated in all the advantages related to the jobs we do. Uh, so. Perhaps one simple way of catching, of capturing that uh, intuition would be, well, if you compare uh, the, a barber working in Calcutta and a barber working in New York or in Kansas City or, uh, or in, in Paris, you can see that the standard of living they have, uh, measured on some sort of common metric, is very unequal. For uh, the amount of work they do, uh, the amount of effort they do, that is quite similar. Why? Well, mainly because of things that have nothing to do with their own efforts, but with technological inheritance, the organizational know-how incorporated in uh, the traffic rules, administration, whatever. And so, because of all these things for which they bear no responsibility, there are huge differences between the incomes these people get. Huh? So, so that the same job can command a wage that's very unequal depending on these circumstances. But the same holds, of course, within a particular society where some people get high incomes, some low incomes, by virtue in part of the talents they have, but also by virtue of all sorts of accidents in life, having had the right mentor at the right time, the right advice, etc. And so my uh, key intuition of what I try to, to formulate, to articulate, to defend against all sorts of objections that what, what we need to do is really, what justice requires us to do, is to give to the people with the smallest gift the biggest gift possible. And that's how you are led, in a fairly straightforward way, to the idea of a non-conditional basic income. You give everyone, you, and you, you sort of tax, resources, incomes, uh, whatever, in all sorts of ways. But isn't it part of the welfare culture? Uh, you know, welfare somehow isn't it part of isn't it part of the thinking having to do with this or not? It, it, it's a particular uh, conception of what the welfare state should be. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, uh, so but the the key idea is that by giving everyone unconditional basic income at the highest sustainable level, you will share these gifts we received from nature, technology, uh, organized societal, the social organizations. Uh, we share this gift 
in the fairest possible way. And it is different from uh, conception of standard conception of the welfare state, which is essentially uh, conceived in terms of solidarity, in terms of covering certain yes. risks. So tell us a bit about what you mean by uh, universal basic income. Yes, so uh, a universal basic income is a particular form of guaranteed minimum income uh, that is it's special uh, in three ways uh, because it's strictly individual. So whether you get it and how high the, that income is, is independent of the family situation. Two, it's also uh, uh, unconditional in the sense that it's given to the rich as well as to the poor, so no means test. And thirdly, it's also unconditional in the sense that there is no counterpart that is expected, so it's not restricted to the people who are uh, involuntarily unemployed, uh, willing to take a job. It's also given to housewives or house husbands, uh, everybody uh, to students, every to tramps. Uh, everyone is entitled to it. At, at what age? At which? At what age does it start? Well, depending on the formula, you can integrate it with uh, child benefits, or you can keep a separate universal child benefit as right of the child, and then combine it with a basic income. Uh, for, for all adults from uh, 18 uh, onwards. You can also have a high level as a basic pension, which already exists as a sort of unconditional universal basic pension in some countries. And so there can be a number of uh, uh, variants. Um, but what defines a basic income hmm, is not that it's sufficient to satisfy basic needs, but it's simply that it's really strictly unconditional so that you can combine it with any other income that comes on top of it. And, and, and what is the main purpose of this universal basic income? Well, the, uh, maybe one way of uh, uh, explaining uh, at least one of its central purposes, because there have been many justifications for it in the course of the history of, of ideas, but the way in which I came to it was really uh, in uh, the following context. Because in the early 80s, and uh, I, along with a number of uh, other people, were trying to think about how to address the huge unemployment problem which uh, started uh, uh, appearing in Europe uh, at the time. And there were two standard answers to that. There was the, the usual uh, answer given by uh, both the right and the left uh, establishment, which consists in saying we must go for more growth. Mm. So, of course, there was an annual growth in productivity that with unchanged output would create to more unemployment. So what we needed to do is grow and grow faster and faster so that we could constantly outrace the uh, growth of productivity. And I, along with a long other number of other people, started thinking this is crazy to just go for this mad rush for more and more growth in order to absorb this uh, massive uh, involuntary unemployment. So there was another option that was offered, but beginning to be offered at the time, it was the, the neoliberal creed. Huh? Consists in saying, no, what you need to do, uh, try to accelerate growth, that's not the way to do as such. What you need to do is simply lower wages. Pro your problem, if there is unemployment, is simply that labor is too expensive. Lower the wages, the demand will increase, and the supply will fall, and you'll reach a new equilibrium. But of course, we, what we wanted to do is to fight both unemployment and poverty. And the neoliberal uh, approach, even if it worked, there were good reasons also to believe it wouldn't work, but even if it worked, it was only at the expense of creating then a large category of working poor. Was there an alternative? Yes. We that was the answer. And that was uh, uh, basic income. We, we thought, well, isn't there something else that could be done, which consists in giving everyone a non-conditional basic income, whether uh, they are work, they are at work or not, whether they, are, they want to work or not. And the, you could see that proposal as a way, as a sort of soft method for working time reduction. That is, you enable, it's not, not an authoritarian working time reduction by saying you can't work more than 30 hours per week or so. No, but you give people more of the possibility to reduce their working time when they feel they need to work less because they have children or because they want to, to retrain or because they're 
<coughs> they want to breathe a bit in order to avoid a, a burnout. And so you, you enable people to work, who work too much to work less, and you enable then the people who don't work at all and suffer from being excluded to take these jobs. Mm -hmm. and so that was the idea. So you can then have a, a, another way of addressing unemployment that doesn't create uh, poverty and doesn't go for this yeah. mad rush. And so you, you, formula you, you formulated this idea with colleagues in the early uh, 80s. Was it a new idea? You, you alluded to uh, a minute ago to the fact that, in fact, uh, somehow a number of people had played with this idea uh, before that. So tell us a bit about the history of this idea. Yes. So uh, when uh, I first hit on that idea, uh, I hadn't seen it anywhere else, and so I had to coin uh, uh, an expression for it in French, which uh, was allocation universelle. I like the expression because it suggests an analogy with universal suffrage. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was sort of basic economic power, which is given to everyone, just as a basic e a political power is given in the form of universal suffrage. But like often when you have an idea which you think is uh, really genial, uh, interesting, uh, you think, well, either it will turn out to have a sort of major defect, or it will turn out that a number of other people had the idea before. I've still not found a major defect with it, uh, sort of a, many objects, many difficulties, but not, uh, no fatal defect. But what I and others, also thanks to others, discovered was that a quite a large number of people had had that idea before, indeed, that there had been, at various points of history, some sort of public debate about it. The two main uh, places where uh, there had been a public debate before the European debate and then later the, the worldwide debate uh, started, uh, so from the mid-1980s uh, onwards, the two main places were, uh, the, uh, were England in uh, the 1920s, the early 1920s, where there was something called the State Bonus League that proposed something that was really a universal basic income. but was then uh, marginalized subsequently, but there were uh, the, the first professor of political theory in Oxford, <coughs> G.D.H. Cole, was one advocate of uh, this idea and also a member of the leadership of the Labour Party at the time. It disappeared and then you had the beverage report and the social security system, the welfare state went a different way. Then it came up again in the U.S. in the late 60s and where the main advocate of it was Jim Tobin. Yes. Jim Tobin uh, was, became then uh, one of the economic advisors of George McGovern in the, for the 1972 uh, presidential elections, and he had managed to put on the platform, uh, McGovern's platform, the idea of a demo ground, what was called at the time a demo ground, and which was again <laughs> a real unconditional basic income. But how would you finance this uh, basic income? I mean, how do you, uh, should it be financed through taxes? I mean, uh, uh, what would be uh, your way of doing it? There can be several ways, and uh, several ways will be relevant in different ways will be relevant in different countries. I'll just mention two, which are really both of them central, and the second one will be increasingly relevant. So, the the first and main way <coughs> in most of the countries where it has been proposed is through a reform of the income tax system. It's very simple to. Uh, picture how it, the first step would happen, and so where you introduce a modest basic income, insufficient to live on, but a real basis for everyone's income, and say at the level of $500 or $600, $800 per person and per month. And um, how would it be financed? Well, there are all the people who currently re already receive some sort of social income, pension, unemployment benefit child benefit, etc. And in all those cases, you just replace the lowest part of these benefits by the unconditional basic income. So the rest remains paid to them, and so in net terms, uh, the unemployment benefit, etc., at a lower level in such a way that they don't lose out compared to the present situation. Then you have all the people who currently have a significant regular income. These people currently enjoy, in all the existing tax system, they enjoy tax, uh, uh, tax uh, deductions or credits or whatever in such a way that the, the first 
uh, layer uh, the first of their uh, incomes is either not taxed at all or taxed at a very low level. So even the very rich receive this present from the tax authorities in the form of a, of a zero level of taxation or very low level of taxation on, on the, the first layers of income. You just scrap all that and you replace it by a basic income or if you want in the form of a refundable tax credit for these people. And so that the net cost is really for the remaining, the people who remain, who have neither a social income nor a sufficiently high uh, income on which, uh, where you have mm -hmm. the tax relief that's replaced by, uh, by basic income. And, and what would be the, the individual and social benefits that you, en that you would envision out of this uh, basic income? I mean, what would be the added value for, for a given individual and for society as a whole? Well, the, the, the main benefit, so even if, if you see it just funded in this particular way, uh, consists in really having this unconditional basis on which you can rely. That means uh, the, the problem of exclusion nowadays uh, is partly related to the fact that all our uh, transfer systems, or most of our transfer systems, are really focused, restricted, targeted at the people who have no income from another source or very low income, which means that as soon as they try to get out of their situation, they are punished through the withdrawal of the benefit they uh, enjoyed by virtue of being in that situation. And that's the so-called unemployment trap or poverty trap or dependency trap. And so and the, and the, the, the well-intentioned focus on the poor uh, has as a consequence that people are trapped in this situation of poverty. And that's why uh, a, a, an unconditional basic income can be presented as a way of fighting at the same time exclusion from work and uh, income poverty. You give an income, but you don't trap people in this situation of dependency because you can, rel you can keep counting on it if you find a part-time job or if you find a low-paid job that can be combined. And, with and this basic basic income wouldn't be a substitute for, for instance, unemployment benefits. That wouldn't be a, a substitute. It, it, it would be a basis which mm -hmm. would be supplemented up okay. to the current level of the unemployment benefits mm -hmm. uh, by uh, a benefit that would then be conditional on the situation but, of being uh, and, and so my unemployed. second question is uh, how has it been received because for the past 20 years we have been uh, we have been witnessing the dismantlement of the welfare state and therefore you are through this measure calling for more resources being allocated at a time when somehow we have a, a retreat across the board in terms of allocation of resources for for poverty issues and so on so how is it being received and uh, uh, what is the political likelihood to have uh, tractions, uh, to have traction happening uh, in regard to this uh, idea. Yeah. Well, first thing, it's important to see that it's more a way of restructuring our welfare state in a way that uh, so as to make it more uh, uh, more uh, uh, efficient in the current context. It's more that than a sort of big expansion of the so welfare state. It's not so expansion, it's, it's restructuring. It's a restructuring in such a way that you, you put this basis, this socle, uh, under all forms of income in such a way that the back and forth between work, family, and training, education, will can happen in a far more flexible way than was the case before. And so the... So the and, and so the, the economic advantages of uh, this sort of uh, reform of it are no less important in, for the practical feasibility of it uh, than the, uh, the social justice uh, arguments in, in favor of it. But <coughs> in, uh, so that part of the motivation, certainly in the interest for the proposals, for example, there has been an active debate now for, uh, which there had never been before for the last four years or so in Germany, Part of it has to do with finding a way of tackling unemployment in a, uh, in a flexible way, in a way that doesn't uh, really, tackling unemployment and tackling poverty in a way that doesn't sort of handicap the functioning mm -hmm. of, uh, of the economy. And it has received a further push, and that's uh, uh, also an answer to your question about the financing, from uh, an unexpected uh, corner, but that uh, 
is likely to gain in importance. In fact, for just in the in the last uh, a few uh, months, there has been one country in the world for the first time that ha that is in the process of introducing a real basic income for all its uh, citizens. Huh? Before that, there was Which only country? the state of Alaska that mm -hmm. had it, and now Iran has been uh, introducing a basic income for a reason that's uh, very interesting to understand. So Iran, for now a number of years, had realized that uh, its economy was performing what was functioning in a very irrational, economically irrational way. Why? Because uh, petrol and all uh, the oil products inside the territory of Iran were sold at uh, a price that was far below the international price of oil, which led uh, to all sorts of uh, economically rational allocations of uh, resources. People were uh, uh, using petrol in an uh, irresponsible way, and uh, there were all sorts of decisions about where to locate things that were being taken and that uh, really couldn't be uh, defended on economic grounds. So. How do you uh, solve that problem? Obviously by lifting considerably the price of petrol inside of uh, Iran so that in particular you would stop, Iran would stop subsidizing all the exports to mm -hmm. the other countries, all the things incorporating oil. But of course you can't do that without compensating people for... And, the and, uh, and then their first thought of trying to compensate it in a targeted way so that only the poor would be, but that proved administratively extremely complicated. And so they have decided to introduce gradually from last September uh, a genuine basic income, which would be uh, the same amount, irrespective of age, paid in fact to the head of the households, but uh, with the number of basic incomes that correspond to the number of members uh, of the household, initially at a pretty low level because, but it's due to increase as the price of petrol. And so it's happening. And so it's happening, and that suggests, of course, another way of funding a basic income that would make sense not only in oil-producing countries but also in others, which consists in saying you have a, 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 an energy tax, uh, however you raise it, and, uh, and you use the, produ the, 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 the revenues from this tax in order to fund the basic income. For and, and you mentioned earlier that the, in the U.S. the state of Alaska has a basic income device. Yeah, so the, the state of why Alaska... Is, why is it so? I mean, it's quite so interesting. Th that's also, so that's much older. So it was mm -hmm. introduced by a Republican uh, governor. Why would have, uh, why, what was the rational for... Because that's not what, what we would expect from Republicans. No, so that was uh, 1982, so government uh, Hammond uh, at the time, so he uh, so was concerned that the revenues from the exploitation of oil in Alaska would not just benefit the current generation of Alaskans, but also future generations. So he said what we should do is create a fund, uh, what's called the Alaska Permanent Fund, that would belong to the Alaskan population. And in order to uh, motivate the Alaskan electorate to keep this fund going, part of the revenues from this fund should be distributed as a dividend to each Alaskan resident. His initial idea was that the Alaskans would receive an amount proportional than to the number of years they had spent in Alaska. But this was taken to the American Supreme Court and some immigrants from Illinois, I think, uh, made the claim that this was discriminatory and so the Supreme Court of the U.S. forced the Alaskan state to distribute this dividend in a way that would be independent of both age mm. and length of residency, and so as a genuine basic income. Interesting. I want to talk a bit about uh, uh, your ideas <coughs> for, for justice at the global level. I mean, as you mentioned earlier, uh, one, one of the titles of, uh, the title of one of your books is What is a Just Society? And, and it seems to me that uh, throughout the years, your focus on justice has been very much uh, uh, geared towards the national society. So uh, are your ideas uh, relevant at the global level? 
can they help us to think about justice at the global level? And uh, and the fact that we are living more and more in a globalized world, and in the context of which societies are, are less and less self-contained, self-defined, and so on. What does it mean for for your thinking on uh, on on justice? In essence, I mean, uh, how do we move for from your thinking on justice geared towards a given society to justice at the global level? Yes, so it is uh, correct to say that as of my first uh, books, uh, certainly, Qu'est-ce qu'une société est juste in French, my first books on, uh, on justice, and my uh, biggest book, uh, Real Freedom for All, take as the context as all theories of justice practically since Plato have done a particular society. But I've been uh, forced to uh, think more seriously about the scale at which justice... Yes, because it's be. is not a trend. We have to think about this now. Yeah, and, and, and I've been forced to do so for two reasons. Um, one is uh, simply the Belgian and the European context, uh, where, as for, for, and I had uh, lengthy discussions with John Rawls, including a published correspondence about that, and for an American, it may be obvious enough what uh, the people are, that is, what one's people is in one's society. But for a Belgian, this is not so obvious, uh, partly because a uh, number of people say that uh, Belgium, not being a nation, should uh, uh, be uh, split into uh, two or three separate bits. So what is the society which should be just? Is it Belgium as a whole? Is it each of its uh, uh, communities? And also, of course, European integration with a labor market that functions at European level with mobility across the borders makes it uh, absurd to keep thinking about justice simply at the level of uh, an individual member state. So that's one of the reasons yes. why I was led to think, well, is really what, what is this society? And in fact, we must justice itself must guide us in deciding what we want to turn into a society. Should it be Belgian? Should it be European integration? Uh, uh, should it be European Union and so on? That's one uh, aspect. And the other, the other aspect was, uh, the other thing that led me really to, to fo focus on that was uh, something that's best captured, but something that happened to me during a trip in, uh, in Igboland, so in the eastern part of uh, of Nigeria, and I was about to leave to go and catch uh, my plane when uh, uh, some of the boys that uh, had been children had, had been gathering, uh, one of them uh, said, uh, yes, uh, um, I want to go away. And, um, and I said, no, 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 come on, your mommy will not want you to go with. But, and uh, he said, yes, he she said, would. Yes, <laughs> yes, she, she would, because he knew I was coming from Belgium, and Belgium, they all think there, uh, many people, Belgium is the place where the second-hand cars come from in uh, Nigeria, so Belgium is used as a, as a name to refer to second-hand good cops. I think it's a city in Germany, mm -hmm. but it has a connotation of wealth. And mm -hmm. so, so, no, no, my mom would like uh, me to go with. And so then I mumbled something to tell him why he couldn't come. And I felt bad because this was a, a fair question. When he said, why can't I come? It was a fair question which deserved a fair answer. And I sort of eluded the question and mm -hmm. so on. And so when I was flying back and so on, I really felt that. And I felt that, in fact, this kid there is entitled. Uh, when he says, well, look, you have all these things I don't have. Huh? Why? And, and, in fact, I owe him the same sort of justification as I owe to uh, anyone born on the other mm -hmm. side, my side of any sort of border. And so, fundamentally, what I believe is that and the more we have contacts of this individual sort, not of a diplomatic sort through our representative, with individual people, also with the internet and so on, you get these people, these people join you justificatory community, a community of people who are entitled to uh, justification for the fact that you have more than them. But, but precisely, do we have the tools to really address this question? Uh, you know, historically, one could argue that philosophy, political and social philosophy, I mean, the question or the quest for justice has been uh, pursued at the national level, for the national level. I mean, political philosophy uh, is essentially uh, uh, political philosophy for, for the national realm. And of course, uh, it seems to me that uh, 
today it's not good enough. So uh, do we have the tools to think about precisely uh, issues of justice beyond the national realm, global justice, but also issues of justice within the national realm, the national realm being uh, somehow shaped and defined by global forces? Do we have the intellectual tools to do this? Right. And isn't it true that it is one of the uh, you know, key agendas of the future intellectually and in, in policy terms. Well, there has certainly been uh, a lot of discussion on uh, global distributive justice. And but it's still very unsatisfactory. Yes, but I think the tools in the end will not be fundamentally different from mm -hmm. the one uh, we have been using at uh, the national level. And so the, among uh, the people who've been discussing these issues, there are people like John Rawls himself who really think we uh, need to, uh, but he has been help. heavily criticized for for establishing a, a kind of a, a different. I mean, you know, for for saying that the the global level is not the national level, and what is true for the national level in terms of justice cannot be applied to the yes. to the international yes. level. Yes, certainly. And yeah. So, and and I and I among the people who criticize him uh, on that issue because mm. if there is one real issue more than this thing about basic income, on which I disagree with what, what Rawls wrote, in this case what he wrote in, his, in the book he published only, he wrote only in his in, in, at the late stage when he was into, uh, well into his 70s. And, uh, but if there is one issue on which I disagree, it's really this, this approach to worldwide justice. And so one view which is represented by him is a, is a dual view that says there are two radically different things, fundamentally different things. One is justice, distributive justice, between the individual members of the same people. Mm -hmm. And the other one is, the, uh, is the, the, the justice of the relationship between distinct peoples. And, and, and my own view is monistic in this respect, so I say no. And that's my, my Nigerian story about this, uh, and that uh, essentially we are getting into a single justificatory community where our relationship, we have these relationships with all the people in, in the world who could move, who are prevented from moving to where we are. They cannot be regarded as sort of distinct tribes or distinct cultures. And we are increasingly a single people worldwide. We owe to these people the same justifications. And then what we, and, and the principles of justice, uh, Rawls's principles, or my own uh, con conception, or Dworkin's uh, Amartya sense, must be applied that at, at that level. And then you must, from those principles, guiding principles, you must think, well, subsidiarity, what is the best level at which you must uh, so, so the, the In your view, the principles of justice at the national level, the, the principles of justice at the global level are the same. Yeah. Uh, then the question is, how do you make it happen in concrete terms at the global level? Because it is already difficult enough at the national level. Uh, in fact, you know, for 20 years uh, in the Western world and elsewhere, we have gone against, in fact, uh, any kind of concerns towards uh, economic, social, and political ju economic and social justice. So how do you make it happen at the global level? I mean, if we agree that uh, we have to agree on the principles, then... Uh, how do we go about uh, what would be the right uh, uh, political mechanism? How do we go about uh, somehow uh, uh, dovetailing uh, national political communities and uh, a global society which is still not existing but perhaps uh, in the making? How do we go about this? In you know, we, are, uh, we are having this conversation in the, in the context of the UN and, and in a way, uh, although the UN uh, is partly conservative, it is also quite progressive and it is uh, somehow trying to find answers to these questions. Sure. So what would be your, your way to go about this? Well, that we have to proceed in various ways that are complementary. One way which, to which I attach great importance is uh, the sort of way that's illustrated by European integration. And that, uh, uh, of course, in Europe we have uh, achieved a number of things, including the free mobility of uh, people. Uh, not just of capital and goods, but with uh, the consequence that the ability of each of the national welfare states to do their job in terms of distributive justice, their ability has been weakened. So that there is a, a growing awareness that for justice to be achieved, distributive justice to be achieved at least as much as it was, has been in the past, thanks to these national welfare states, we need to operate at the European level that we must start thinking about interpersonal uh, 
solidarity, interpersonal redistribution, at a level that is not the level of a particular nation. Now, in order to proceed in that direction, a number of preconditions need to be achieved, and this has also something to do with the talk I have to give uh, today here at the United Nations, which is that and when you think about the way in which it happened uh, at the national level, and the welfare states didn't fall ready-made out of the brain of a philosopher or out of the drawer of a bureaucrat. They were the result of struggles by, by the people who were to benefit uh, from it, their representatives. And this was possible in the national context because there was a level of communication that made it possible for people, the, the workers' movements, other associations, to coordinate and to mobilize. One of the conditions is linguistic. You need to be able to communicate cheaply. No? The representatives of the poor need to communicate cheaply, not through a brilliant... Hence the common language and so on. Hence the importance of it. So this is one, one of the preconditions. So when, when we think about uh, how to get through justice, you need to think about these regional um, initiatives, uh, undertakings, massive like uh, the European Union, and think how they can do the job which nation states are no longer able to do. This is one of the ways. But another way is, of course, immediately at the global level. And we realize that we have all these interdependencies which raise questions of justice, which can only be handled at the global level. And the most now striking recent example is climatic change. The environment. Climate change. Yes. But, but, but so, you know, so, so beyond the, uh, what can be the contribution of philosophy to, to identifying the principles and, and finding uh, rational for, 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 for making them being taken seriously, you, you also have somehow to rethink the notion of public policy because so far public policy has been conceived and implemented at the national level. Then in the European context it is becoming to be, it's beginning to be conceived and implemented at the regional level and yet at the global level you, we still don't have a sense of global policy the UN at best uh, you know, uh, expresses and engineers uh, global norms but doesn't have the means, the resources, the mechanism the institution to somehow uh, dovetail these global norms with practices on the ground at the global level which would really uh, amount to a global policy. Is it, is it also something we should be part of our, our agenda for the, for the future in intellectual and, and policy terms? I, I certainly think so. So the, not just the, I believe there is a, there will be a, a greater role to play for the UN uh, uh, institutions in in a broad sense, and so, but also the WTO and the, the ILO and uh, but and the, the Bretton Woods uh, uh, institutions, etc. But we'll we'll get there uh, in a gradual way. So it's really and so my I, I and. The, for us political philosophers, what's important is really to, to get a clear picture of the direction in which we need to go and to submit it to, to, to critique both in terms of its economic consistency and in terms of its uh, ethical uh, uh, acceptability. But then this vision needs to be combined with opportunism, sort yes. of systematic, principled uh, opportunism so that there are all sorts of ways of moving forward, some very yeah. modest, more local, some more yeah. global, and it's important to take advantage but, but of So you that. really believe that uh, bring to the table, which is partly the job of a philosopher, uh, intellectual clarity on any given issue is a way somehow to, 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 to move things forward. I mean, I do believe that clarity helps uh, creating uh, political opportunities. I think we need a, a sort of coalition of very different people. I need, a, and we we need people with a vision, but of course the vision alone won't, yes. won't move the people. We need the sort of thinkers, people who can perceive the opportunities and use them at the right time. And so with sort of flair mm -hmm. for the the opportunities, but you need a sense of direction in order to take the right measure of the, at the same time. And then you. You need uh, some the people you could need uh, call the uh, body kickers or the people who yeah. sort of keep pushing. They say this is uh, absolutely un, uh, unacceptable. So uh, this is unjust. Done, this yeah. is, and so they put pressure. Mm -hmm. And you have NGOs. You have all sort of uh, uh, pressure groups, uh, sometimes political parties, etc. Uh, two questions to perhaps finish our conversation. Uh, what is the way forward for you? <laughs> 
uh, quickly. I mean, what are the things on which we intend to work uh, for the coming years? And I hope you're going to work more and more on global justice. And second question, what would be, uh, I guess that uh, watching us, uh, we will have uh, young people. What would be uh, your advice to, to, to young people who are beginning a career in the, in the, in the world of ideas? So first of all, what is the way forward for you uh, in terms of uh, issues on which you're, be, you're going to be working? Yes, well, I, I've had to be increasingly absorbed by uh, our local uh, uh, public debates in Belgium because we have had no government for eight months now uh, after the general election, and so there are strong tensions. Uh, and, uh, and there is also a problem that is uh, of interest far beyond Belgium because it's really how to make uh, country work that is not a nation that doesn't have a, a single uh, language. Of course, it's in the small the sort of issues that we have to face at the level of the European Union. Because mm -hmm. at the same time in Belgium, we have a very high level of redistribution across the yeah. borders of these linguistic communities. So I find it very important to uh, both uh, answer you. Know the old slogan: uh, "Think globally, act locally." Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to act and think locally because you also need to think <coughs> in a way that's very uh, in tune with the local realities. And but you also need to not only to think globally, uh, but also to to act globally. So in terms of my uh, personal uh, agenda, certainly I'll have to focus on that. I, about to publish a book on uh, uh, linguistic justice, which will no doubt be proved controversial in various circles, and I'll have to do some after sales service mm -hmm. uh, to go and uh, defend uh, some some of of uh, these uh, ideas. And more generally, I've, I'm also about to publish a little collection of essays called Just Democracy, and the subtitle is The Rolls Machiavelli Program, which mm -hmm. is really about how to design political institutions in such a way that they can serve yeah. social justice, which for me is global justice. So mm -hmm. that's the sort of thing I, I want to do and uh, keep, I want to mm -hmm. also to help other people to do. Yeah. Now, the, your second question. The young what generation. Sort of, well, I uh, uh, should uh, say, above all, have hope. There are so many things that go wrong in the world, that need to be fixed. your work, that mm -hmm. need to be fixed, and that need we need to be sharper, we need to be more intelligent than mm -hmm. ever in order to solve our problems. So invest in sort of intellectual competence, but never to lose the passion mm -hmm. that sort of comes from being indignant in front of some injustice. And totally engaged and committed and so on. Totally committed and never lose the hope because I, I w going back to my early years, I've uh, always been struck and often remember this uh, beautiful sentence at the end of uh, Herbert Marcuse's book, uh, uh, One Dimensional Man. It finishes with a quote from Walter Benjamin in German, in the original, uh, which uh, said something, Um der hoffnungslosen Wegen ist uns die Hoffnung gegeben. It's because of uh, the people who don't have any hope left, and there are so many in the world, that hope is given to us. So we need to sort of really, we need a strong coalition between intelligence, the hard work of understanding things in a multidisciplinary mm -hmm. way, and then the, the commitment to doing things better. Sometimes things look desperate, but they can be made better. Mm -hmm. That's my message for them.